previously on Hades Developing Hell. Our fourth game is called Hades. It's a narrative-driven roguelike dungeon crawler in which you battle your way out of the underworld of Greek myth. Slow and steady wins the race because it's gonna go into early access and it's not like we get to go on a break. Oh, oh, oh. Trailer is playing! Oh, oh my god! Congratulations to the guys from Supergiant. That is an early access title they're going to be updating over time, and it's available tonight, right now. All right, cool. Uh, I am actually good to go whenever you are, man. All right, wait, let me roll this. Okay. All right, let's see. I'm wearing the same fucking sweater <laughs> as the last episode of the Noclip documentary, and I didn't know that I was doing that. This Looking is equally as good. No, I don't know, man. <laughs> That's sad. It's been more than a month now since uh, since the Game Awards and since Hades uh, was announced and launched by us, and the the holidays have come and gone, and the year has started off uh, with a bang for us. There was a while we do this thing after we ship, where we patch every day, and I am like addicted to patching. I am completely and hopelessly addicted to patching. I love those times. Um, because the feedback loop is so, so tight. It's like, okay, we fixed this, we added this, I changed this. So after Hades' initial launch, uh, we uh, put out about, uh, not about, exactly six patches over 10 days. And those were uh, split between uh, technical fixes and uh, new new content uh, and balance changes. A lot of that was kind of just the uh, you know, initial uh, you know, cleanup of you know, cruft that uh, any, any new game release has, just uh, you know, compatibility issues. Uh, driver issues. I think the pace, you know, it, in some ways it feels similar to the the months leading up to the initial launch and announcement, but we do have an active player community out there uh, that, that we're keeping an eye on and interacting with on, on a daily basis, so that does, that does uh, change things. They have a lot of feedback. They, uh, I think they have high expectations for us, so I think we do feel um, a certain amount of I don't know, I, I guess it's pressure to, to live up to what they, to, to exceed their expectations really. So yeah, just calibrating players' expectations with what we actually deliver in this first major update will be, will be really interesting. Hopefully they'll still be uh, very happy with the game um, after, after they play what we have in store for this round. We have a roadmap of how we want to build Hades. We know what we want to put in it um, before it's ready, before it's 1.0. And um, one of the realizations we had really early on while, while planning the next update was uh, that people are actually playing this game for a really long time. <laughs> and um, it was surprising to see people kind of keep recursing through the content and stick with it for, for weeks after, after they may have completed um, some of the stuff that we had in there. So we realized that an update that we had planned for much later, maybe like the third or fourth update uh, in our roadmap, needed to come in much sooner. So we actually swapped, uh, we swapped a set of updates in order to, to kind of keep our roadmap intact, but also respond to some of what the community seemed to be. It's not even necessarily that they were asking for it, it's just what they were running into. It was based on our observations of, of what was happening with, with players who've been playing for a long time. Um, so the combination of reading those early comments, looking at our schedule, thinking about what we wanted to actually approach next, um, ended up swapping update four or whatever for update one. So we have a lot of uh, cool new things uh, planned for, for the, the next uh, big update. Um, we're calling this the, the chaos update um, because it has the introduction of, uh, of chaos inside, the, uh, inside the, the blood gates that you can access in the game. This also of course comes with you know, amazing uh, new, new art from Jen and an uh, amazing new uh, sound from Darren. It has a new sort of intense uh, difficulty modification system using Hades Infernal Contracts. We've got a whole new look for the character. We've got new enemies, new environments, and uh, 
almost none of it is exactly where we want it to be. Um, it's close. A lot of it is really close, but we need to finish the art. We need to finish the feedback. We need to finish the text. We need to integrate the voiceover. We need to tune it. We need to play it again after we make the tuning changes to make sure we didn't break something. Um, we need to set up the main menu so you can tell that the game changed. We need to write the patch notes. We need to get the feedback form set up for when more feedback comes in. We need to have a play test where everyone experiences the content and we need to do all of that in three days, I think. Um, I think we can do that because we've done stuff like it. Um, you can just go watch an old Noclip episode to prove that we can do that. Um, but <laughs> the first character we're adding uh, in our first major content update coming in January is Primordial Chaos, the origin of all things. And we are just figuring out what uh, Primordial Chaos is supposed to sound like. We have a beat on it, but yeah. we, uh, there's still some iteration. Yeah. We're trying some stuff right now. Now that the game is out there and um, f folks have played it and seen what it's like, I, I get to talk a little bit more openly about one of the aspects of the world building and, and uh, the story that I've been so excited about, which is that we get to depict some of these characters from Greek myth that I, I don't think have ever been rendered in like modern media before. Hypnos or uh, Nyx or certainly Zagreus is not a character you have necessarily learned about in your one, you know, Greek mythology session in elementary school. And then this time around, we are adding a primordial chaos. It's basically the creation myth of Greek mythology. You may be familiar with the theory of the Big Bang, for instance, and chaos is essentially the Big Bang from a Greek mythology point of view. It's like in the beginning, there was void. And then from chaos sprang the Titans and from the Titans sprang the gods and heaven and earth and everything in between and so on. It's like, oh man, that is intense. So here would be the combo with that same processing. The machines have all grown soft, but you might agree. That's interesting. It's just like the, too much going on now. Yeah, maybe. The, the echo is like not terrible, but yeah. The machines have all grown soft. To me, this already has like, it sounds like a man and a woman talking already to me. Oh, you know? we have met in a way. I know everybody here and there. I think it sounds pretty rad. You wish to leave this place, and it is my wish to make your doing so a little bit more interesting. It, you know, for me, from a writing standpoint, it all so clearly ties back into the themes of what this game is going for in its story, because in a story that's really about family, uh, chaos is the most distant relative that all these characters have. Um, so I want to understand how these character, how the dynamics of these characters uh, play out as a family. So I need to know who their families are. Uh, so I had to trace that all the way back, all the way back down their family tree, and it ends with primordial chaos. There's nothing before that. So it was, it felt really good to be able to take this character, come up with our take on it, and. Uh, on them, I should say, and, and, and put them in our game. Oh, dang. Oh, she. It's early, but it's, it's pretty, pretty exciting. sweet. Yeah. I'm basically like, oh, it's, it's like super it's messed a, up. It's a, it's a, it's like a Final Fantasy la last boss. So <laughs> yeah, it kind of is. I'm down with that. <laughs> I'm so down. Yeah, it's gonna be wild, right? Yeah, right? it's gonna, gonna be gonna awesome. Be expecting that. In the modern era of games. Feedback is everywhere. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we're seeing feedback in our official Discord. There's a subreddit for us. Uh, social media has a lot of feedback. So I'm getting emails. I got all these emails over the break from people <laughs> who had played it. Um, there was a bug I got from Gavin that was just a picture of a series of text messages, angry text messages he got from his friend about the way I had tuned one of the Poseidon uh, god boons. So uh, there's a lot of feedback. There's a lot of feedback. It's coming from every place. So how do we how do we stay on top of the feedback? We could just spend 100% of our time, you know, mon monitoring feedback coming in. And if we do that, <laughs> we're spending no time actually addressing it. So I've wondered if. I carve out specific times to check in on the community and then just sort of not do it uh, when it 
isn't those times, um, I suspect that that'll help me and just kind of structure my time and, and my life in general now that it's a whole new universe for us. So that's something I've, I've been thinking about for myself. That has been a perpetual learning experience. At first, we just took all this loose feedback and Morgan and Michael went through it in JIRA and there was 3,500 entries. And it's like the 117 things could be saying the same things. Uh, we could wipe out 30 of them just by fixing a bug because some people are giving us feedback about something that's actually just like something that was broken and we didn't realize it. And then we moved to this system where you could upvote feedback in Discord and that's been really nice because it sort of gives us an overview and a snapshot of what are people thinking about and looking at. But then that feedback needs to become action. So it needs to go into our task tracker. It needs to get some time in the background of our minds to be thought about. Some of it's real easy and we can just do right away. Some of it requires a conversation. And are you really ready in your production schedule to derail what you're doing to have a couple conversations about, you know, some of the feedback that's coming in? I would say like 60% of the feedback we get is like specifically about game tuning. Like, you know, the sword is weak, the sword, the sword isn't strong enough. It's not straightforward how to address that and that goes through multiple iterations. And it's a game with tons of different uh, kind of abilities, the different boons you get from the gods and different weapon upgrades you could get from what we call the Daedalus Hammer. And they all have like synergistic effects. So you could have the spear, you know, with, with uh, Poseidon's upgrade on it, with like a particular Daedalus Hammer upgrade and, you know, like a, a couple of other items equipped at the same time. So, so we just start hearing from different players about their different like builds and skill combinations and stuff like that. And we start looking at more, um, more nuanced examples of where players were either getting stuck or like, you know, we're able to trivialize encounters that were meant to be more challenging. One problem we had was uh, people were complaining that when you would throw the, uh, the shield weapon uh, in uh, the Asphodel um, biome that it would uh, keep, uh, just keep traveling uh, way off screen because there's no walls there uh, for it to bounce off of. Uh, so uh, we made a number of changes to, to get it to return uh, to the player uh, faster as a, a nice uh, quality life uh, update to, to the weapon. Unfortunately, that introduced a bug where uh, the shield actually uh, damaged you. We pushed a patch where the god boon applied to the shield throw would do damage, would apply it back to you when the shield like actually came back and returned to you. So you would like throw out your shield with a newly buffed Ares boon and it would come back and hit you and do like 60 damage to you and then you would die. I thought it was kind of funny. We fixed it, you know, in 12 hours. It was no big deal. It's not like we lost anyone forever. That's part of early access. Every game is going to have that moment. That's like a game development magic moment right there where, you know, it's not like we didn't test it. We played it. We tested stuff. We just missed this thing. You're just going to miss these things, especially if you're, if you're pushing as often as we are on the, on the weeks that we push a lot of patches. <laughs> That was a bad place. Our elite seems to stun. No, he can't even stun them, so everything. Because he got a wall slam, they just didn't stun. Well, it's because they're immune to stun. Oh, they are? Aren't they? Yeah, you can learn more from like one minute of watching someone play the game uh, than, <laughs> than like your own hour of playing it. Um, there is so much value in watching a streamer play your game, whether there's someone with three viewers or there's someone with, you know, 10,000 or 20,000 viewers. And he's got the fucking, he's got a shop here. I mean, his run could last. Oh! This is so hard to watch. Oh, the cruelty! We, before we pushed a patch, there was this whole thing I could just see, no one was really complaining about it, but I could just see people missing with the mouse when they use the cast ability. And knowing that we had fixed it, but we hadn't pushed the patch live was like really painful. It was actually really hard for me to watch streams where people are running into things that I know we've changed. Uh, patch. Gotta push the patch. You would have to restart the game anyways. Gavin, you have to push the patch. I can't watch this. Oh, good. There is a realness and a rawness to it, and there is information in almost every action taken. Because one of the things a streamer does that maybe, you know, your friend sending you notes doesn't do as well is they're expressive. They're talking about their experience in a direct way. They are uh, thinking about the choices out loud. I think something that's coming up a 
in our own conversations and our own thoughts is like discipline. We think about discipline a lot and we have production discipline and we also need to start developing different kinds of self-discipline because when a game is live, you could be tuning in all the time and uh, some part of you needs to know this is where I go into the hole or go back to the lab and figure stuff out. Oh, he doesn't know there's a six head one, huh? Nope. That's gonna be a pleasant surprise. Oh! 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 <laughs> That's probably like exactly how we wanted the first yeah. hydro run to go. Actually. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Now we want him to stop playing, patch the game, fight the hydro <laughs> again. It's all good, push the patch. Yeah, so I'm recording some sort of emergency <laughs> pickups for Zag and Skelly. We're adding a thing, uh, which is sort of like a trophy system for completing runs with certain amounts of heat active. So making the game super hard and completing runs. And then we're gonna have these statues that are revealed in uh, the area with Skelly. And he's gonna say stuff about them and Zagreus is gonna say stuff about them. So. I gotta record a bunch of lines for each of them because I happen to happen to voice both of those characters. They're going to ship tomorrow. We're going to push them to the world tomorrow, theoretically. Uh, but yeah, so we, we're gonna like incorporate, I think it's like 91-ish lines. Okay, <clears throat> the Skelly Trophy System line 674. This is Zagreus talking. I just gotta remind myself of that. Don't do all these lines as Skelly. <clears throat> What's all this? What's all this? <clears throat> What's all this? A little more skeptical, maybe? What's all this? I think either the first one, let me do one more. What's all this? Maybe the first one or the last one. 675. Let me guess. They want me to fight all the way through the underworld, having used the Pact of Punishment to my bedchambers to make the going even more treacherous than it already is, and if I succeed, they'll reward me with some sort of useless trinket. Okay, not bad. Just a couple accent-y things. We, we want to manage our time during early access in this pretty regimented way where we have these major updates on a regular basis and that does bring with it um, a certain amount of pressure for sure. Like we, once we have those dates out there, it's like ga game developers are pretty notorious for missing their dates, I think. If we miss one of our major updates, is it the end of the world? Like, I don't know, but we've never done something like that before. Um, and, and I think we will do our best to prevent that from ever happening. Um, Cause those, those commitments that we make, we take them very seriously. Early access is a learning process for us. The schedule I think is probably the hardest um, problem for us to overcome. This particular milestone, the artist kind of got pitched over, like pitched a lot of work in the very last week of our milestone. So we are kind of scurrying to get, to react to a lot of the designer changes and a lot of um, the content changes that that uh, we hope to get into this patch. It's gonna happen though, because everyone here is awesome and doing really great work. Joanne is doing amazing. She just made like three maps in three days, I think, which is not a pace our players should expect us to maintain. Um. <laughs> a lot of the Gameplay aspects of the update are in, but it's poorly tuned and there's no art. <laughs> uh, so, what we're trying to do right now is we just had a, you know, we just have a huge design meeting basically to go over the last details of the tuning. Then we also have this art meeting. We're going to go through and talk about each of the different pieces that do or don't have art and what we can do to get to get the art in. Previously, we had this style of Zagreus's render, um, his animations kind of match the look of our approach in Transistor um, and Pyre, which is a little more dissimilar to the rest of the art direction and style of Hades, um, environment-wise, effects-wise, etc. So we are hoping to bring Zagreus in line um, with the rest of the game so that 
he both reads better on the background um, or in the environment and also uh, just matches the game stylistically in more of that like cell shaded like inked look um, so that update is going in I'm pretty excited about that uh, because We've been talking about it for a long time. Uh, it was just one of those larger endeavors that we knew we would we would have to like give space to. Okay, awesome. So first thing is on the Zagreus re-renders. Um, uh, you know something? Uh, yeah, Paige. Are you? Do you know what a marker is? Yes. Okay. Uh, the Zagreus re-renders need their markers re-rendered as well. I'll, yes. Okay, is that something you're in, in the in the process of? That is something that, who, which the process of was not told to me, so I'm not sure how to handle that. Okay. okay, okay, but you know how to do them, or you don't know how to do them? I don't know how to do them. Okay, is Camilo, is it possible to contact Camilo? Yeah, I talked to him on Friday, so. Okay, I think the process is, um, Find Camilo. Find Camilo. <laughs> I had a conversation with Amir that I want to make sure, like for me, that's the thing. Like, I don't want this to be us hyping everything and then sweeping the like tough stuff under the rug. Um, and uh, Camilo has been with us um, since the early days of Transistor. So he brought the characters of Transistor to life and to Pyre and the characters of Pyre to life and, and, now, and now Hades. And uh, he's, he's been with us uh, for a long time and he's at a point in his life where it sounds like it's time for him to, he wants to make some, some pretty big changes in his life. And one of those changes is, is, is moving on from, from this place. Okay. I can be more involved if necessary, but it'd be much better for Camilo to just tell you. Like there's just, there's a script. He has a script that does this. That's what needs to happen is um, you need to run the script with some parameters. Um, and that will create these SGA files and okay. then need to be need to be checked in. So I don't think it's going to be terribly complex if we can just get a list of the steps from him. I'll, I'll miss him a great deal. He, his perspective has been invaluable uh, in the work that we've done to this point. Um, and I'll be really excited to see what he comes up with next because I think he's a, he's a genius animator. He, one animator has done uh, everything in our games since Transistor, any 3D models, all that stuff too. So, uh, yeah, he's he's been a one-stop shop, and we've since had Paige Carter has been helping us on 3D modeling for a while. So we're not um, Camilo staying with us for a while uh, to help with the transition. We have a, you know, we're we're looking for we 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 actually posted um, a job opening at the end of, toward the end of last year. Um, so we have a lot of applicants that we're starting to go through and all that, but it's gonna be a big change. Like this is a, this is a studio where the number of folks who've moved on over the years, you can count on, you can count on one hand. So one of the things we end up having to do a lot is have what we call like what to do meetings. That's where we usually get like people from who just represent expertise in different aspects of the game, art, engineering, design, whatever, creative uh, development, and we put them all together to help solve problems. And in this case, one of the problems we're trying to solve right now is we have this weapon that internally we call the monster weapon, but it's basically like a gun that you shoot at guys. And this is a challenging one because it's a move while fire weapon. It's the kind of weapon that allows you to skate around and shoot it. And in a lot of 2D games, there are weapons like this, but uh, at the very high standards of quality at Supergiant Games, um, it can be hard sometimes to execute this stuff. So yeah, we end up having long conversations trying to figure out what the best way forward is. So the thing that we talked about yesterday, since we've all been having conversations about this kind of separately, um, is... Uh, how can we reasonably do a move while fire weapon without doing like walk legs and all the crazy stuff to make his legs look like he's strafing? So one of the ideas that came up is like, can he float while doing it? So I have the monster weapon here <laughs> with him floating. 
Uh, I'm sure it looks great to you on the top screen. It's like throwing out malt balls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the idea. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I know there's a lot of temptation to do a bunch of like really crazy shit, but I wonder if he can just hold a gun and shoot it while floating. <laughs> I, I, yeah, and I, I might. Uh, well, you can't already do that, Steven. <laughs> <laughs> How is that a ridiculous statement? Yeah, in our, in like, like my, I, I had, I had, my reservations around that were like, that is not the fantasy of firing a gun. You know, like yeah. it, it is not. It doesn't include the part where you're floating. <laughs> um, but, but, but there are examples. You know, there are examples like Space Harrier. If you're familiar with that. Or he's like, but you know, the gun is not the source of his flying. He just incidentally is able to fly while also holding a bazooka. Yeah, uh, so that's is like pretty ridiculous by today's standards. Yeah, but but our man floats. Like he he does this right when you when you fire a uh, when you fire a thing he floats. Like watch, I'll fire it and he'll float. <laughs> I'll prove it. Woo. You're right. You're right. It's done. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just saying there, there in the fiction exists re yes, reasons correct. for him to no, press precedent that is very important. Float. I'm just saying the combination of floating and gun. This is this is what's in Greek myth is is like a little like this is definitely one of those like this is like a pyre level concept yeah. that I will have to reach fucking deep. Which yeah. is maybe fine. I just like I don't have any immediate answers. And but, then but I think I think the problem is uh, so I get what you're saying, and I think Greg has the same concern. Yeah. Um, my my feeling is why are we trying to justify the floating? Like we didn't justify it when he when he flies off the ground and does his little flip. So like if he just holds his gun like you like he would hold it, and he happens to float while using it, I don't actually know that the gun needs to make him float. Like he's no. he's just choosing to fire it that way. You're just saying Zagreus can just float. Well, yes, he already be because he already <laughs> does today. He does that. I don't know. Okay, what are you guys talking about when he, you're saying he already floats? Look at look, look at the look at this. Josh, you're leaving at the exact right time. Look at this. <laughs> it's fine. You have an ally in Greg. Um, that floating is weird. Um, so. Like look what, at what floating are you referring to? Look, I mean, I know like look at the cast. Like, look at the cast. Look at this. Him uh, having a moment of floating during his attacks and animations is normal because he's a powerful character. He's like springing around. It's like yeah, he is powerful, but like flying. What he's doing here is not floating. He's flying. Uh, I do agree personally, particularly because we're talking about uh, uh, like a weapon whose archetype is a gun. Like if like if the archetype was was a was like Iron Man's you know repulsor blasts or whatever, then it's all good. I think it should make some kind of sense, any kind of sense at all, mm -hmm. would be the constraint I ask for. Yeah. Um, the so so if it if it remind you know the way that the shield that that it reminds you of something. I think we actually want this to remind us of something if we can help it, as opposed to like the auras or something in Pyre where it's a whole new universe that you have to learn. Doing weird weird stuff, which is fine. We have a weird weapon in the game already with with the shield, but the shield at least people recognize it as like a Captain America shield. In this case, the walk legs to me seem like it would just be for a single animation, right? He just has the fire and run animation. And the reload. Well, yeah. no, well, and start, and stop, and reload, and idle. That's the problem. So yeah, because like, it'll have a special attack, it'll have a reload. And yes, this is like literally this, the simple, this, this execution, however silly, is literally the simplest way for us to do this. It is two animations. It is a fire and a trigger release. That's like the whole animation. My feeling isn't he's got a float and it's gotta be a gun. It's yeah. more like, I like how this feels and works and it feels really different than the other weapons. And without having to invest in a bunch of new technology and stuff, it basically works like this yeah. with a trigger release graphic and a fire graphic. It's the most important process we have here because it's like exactly what collaboration looks like and sometimes what creative chemistry looks like too because it's, uh, it's kind of messy. It always is. The things you think are gonna go really fast sometimes take forever. Some of the things you think are gonna take forever and have high conflict and we're gonna be lost in the woods for a while and end up going by really fast. So yeah, you never know. That's the lesson.
I have no idea ever, even after nine years of working with these people and some of them for longer than that. Yeah, that was the thing I was that was the thing I was asking you actually. So so the part like the the actual the asset that has all the information did not leak, which is cool. Um, yeah, so it's just the image. Yeah, that's actually pretty <laughs> that's pretty convenient. It's nine thirty nine AM on, on uh, January fifteenth. This is the date of our uh, first major update. We've promoted that our first major update is out today. Um, but we intended to reveal the contents at the time that the update actually went live uh, to kind of like keep it keep it a secret. But it sounds like some of the uh, updated artwork uh, has gone up prior to the update. So it's a little bit un unfortunate because it creates confusion. It creates anxiety because there are players out there who like want to play it and they're like, well, why is the art up? But I can't download it yet. Is something wrong with my computer in the world? And it's like, dude, just Everything's gonna be okay. But thankfully, I'll take this leaking over the announcement uh, of the game itself leaking last month. So it's a, I'll, I'll take that trade. Uh, so basically what we're doing right now is we need a smoke test to build. So that means going through and making sure all the major stuff works like saving and uh, loading the game and uh, the major features we added are all still working. Uh, yesterday, a lot of us played played the game, and we have our QA running. But uh, you never know uh, if you make a couple last minute changes, a couple last minute fixes, if those can destabilize the game. And you'd rather find that out before you release the patch than when you're watching a stream of someone playing. These are all the small changes that went in from noon to 7:45 last night. Uh, you know, we found in one of the new maps something blocks your path, and we have to figure out why. Greg had to update the patch notes because of the changes that happened that afternoon. Uh, we made some last minute tuning to the new dead zone settings and to the new trove tuning. We found a huge bug where suddenly you couldn't cancel out of using the bow or the spear and we probably would have gotten a lot of sad bow and spear users talking about that. So it's an example of the stuff we catch right at the end. Um, and we have to make sure that any fixes to these don't like break the whole game. <laughs> that is what we have to do. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's the morning. That's what all our mornings are. So we got a bug yesterday where you would, um, when you entered the new mini boss room in uh, Asphodel, you would sometimes just spawn in without riding the boat, and that doesn't happen with any other rooms. So uh, that's a good sign, which means it's contained to just this room. And I just realized that it's a simple data issue. So. When we build Asphodel rooms or any room, we got it. We have to like specifically say which directions you can enter from. Some rooms have uh, exits on the left. Some rooms have exits on the right. And for this room, because of copy pasting, uh, a lot of times we copy paste data just because uh, we have all the default set from a different room. This room had it set to left and right. Uh, so when you would enter from the right, it wouldn't find a boat going in that direction, and it would just spawn you in the center. Uh, so it's just a simple bug fix, but it's part of the process of creating new maps. Uh, a lot of times it's hard to test because the game's randomized, so I could play the game a hundred times, and there's technically still a probability that I'll always enter this room from the left, uh, which is why a lot of times uh, we do full team uh, play test right before a patch where everyone gets to play the game and uh, chances are we'll find one of those randomized bugs. Yeah, it's our first time doing it. First major update. So I really want to know what people think about the changes we added. There's also some like, will this update, you know, answer all their hopes and dreams um, for what they what they wanted to see in, in an update that comes a month later. So there's going to be a lot that we're going to learn really fast maybe in a couple hours or a couple days about how this process is going to go for the next however long it takes us. This is Jenkins. He is our build server. He uh, creates builds for us. The current configuration I have set up to uh, push the actual build live. So this is a dangerous button to never hit at a time when we uh, don't actually want to hit it. But I am going to hit it now after double checking everything. It's properly going. Uh, this upload is pretty fast. It takes about three minutes 
or so. Uh, and then once that goes, we will verify that uh, everybody has it on the Epic launcher, though of course on Epic's back end, it can also take a little bit of time to propagate. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this, is good. Yeah, this is a good patch. Patch is live because my mom is calling me. <laughs> hey mom, that's not a good patch. <laughs> now they'll start propagating it. Uh, yes, but it's normally very, very fast. The okay. epic side has never taken. It's patch number 54? That's a lucky number in Chinese. Nice. I mean, it means we have don't numbers die. all over the <laughs> place. Not die. Uh, auspicious patch. Yeah. I mean, no death. Jenkins says 54 for something. The actual build number is 12868. You know, we're, right, internally, this is, publicly, this is patch 7. So pick a number, whatever right. your favorite number is, you can oh, use. There was also a, there was oh, also a full site update today. Okay, your uh, so uh, uh, auto updates on, so you, yeah, just launch site. and then it should. <laughs> yeah, it's not, um, there you go, sweet. Boom, uh, it's done. It's cute and not updated yet. Are you, are, mine's yeah, updated. Not because I just want to make it. It's here, it's here, the update's live. Yeah, okay, in first. chat, he's saying that. Yeah, yeah. all right, so there you go. So so here he goes, look at that. Look, look. Oh, finally, nice. We can play something. Heads of later updates. Boom. Curl's updated, guys. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, his internet's like His internet is way faster. better than our internet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, here, here we go. Here we go. Okay, now the, the question is, should I use the pump or should I go into the blood gate? Okay. Like, blood gate is... Um, blood gate. Uh, I want to see the blood gate. But I will. <laughs> I, blood gate. I will reach here through the internet. Do it. Go off of the right. sky. What's in this? Here we go. Here we go. Oh. This is the new god, probably. This is not someone I have in the name of Hades. Who is it? Ah. <laughs> they have all grown soft. Chaos. Oh, that's that's the prime. Oh, is it Stencil, Primadora, Arginator. Wow, we. <laughs> the art is red. Red? Yes, it is. <laughs> the eyes and the, um, the, the faces and the eyes on the bottom. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> Call to remedy for the next three encounters, lane falls, toss an inferno bomb at you. Afterwards, restore 36 life. Wow, for the next two encounters, each time you special, suffer after. What? Oh, wow, that's a pretty good thing because yeah. who needs special abilities? <laughs> that's crazy. This guy hates specials real hard. Um, for the next three encounters, each time you attack. Wow. Uh, today is uh, Monday, February 11th, and it is the day before our second major update goes live. It's the Good Times update, where we're releasing the God of Wine Dionysus and our new ultimate weapon called the Adamant Rail, which I'm taking one last look at before we, before we ship it. One of the things that can really help with creative problems is to give yourself a little bit of space. So we took a little time, thought about uh, that move and fire weapon a little more and realized in our hearts what we really wanted out of the weapon was for it to like feel and, and operate like a gun. Um, and so we ended up going in a direction where you could still stand still by fire, the secondary is a grenade, and uh, Greg had to make sense of it so he called it Exegriff, the adamant rail. It's a firearm that is a precursor to all other firearms in the world, a weapon so dangerous it had to be locked away by the gods. So that's where we ended up through the power of figuring it out, waiting on it a bit, and, um, and and seeing what we really needed from it. Yeah, last we spoke, we had just launched our first major update, and here we are um, about 24 hours away from the launch of our second major update. This one is more like the real thing in a way, because now that we've done the full cycle once before, and having done it a second time, I think we're more uh, finding our groove, but there are certainly um, many aspects of doing it the second time that were that were different from the first, and I uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we like continue to evolve um, aspects of this process. Like every single time we do it, even though the the general 
gist of it might might be similar from one update to the next. We learned a lot actually from the chaos update. Like, uh, I think we were pretty happy with just how much stuff we got into the update, but we were uh, not necessarily super thrilled with how much it took out of the team to do. In some ways, it was like as hard, if not harder, than just launching the game into early access because. Um, it was our first time processing, you know, thousands of loose notes of feedback. We, we made some key changes since our first update, basically like reducing the amount of time for raw new like feature work so that there's more time um, to polish and iterate on the new features that are there. We release a big update and there, there's hopefully a lot of excitement for a couple of weeks and then it'll kind of simmer down a little bit. Hopefully with these big updates we do get uh, people to come back and re-engage with the game because we, you, you know, it's really important to us because that means we get the feedback that we want so that we can make the next one a good one and around and around we go. So all of that's, you know, work in progress but I think we're feeling pretty good about where we're at right now and certainly I think as a team uh, I think there's like sort of less exhaustion um, than there was coming out of the chaos update. Uh, but, you know, I haven't talked to everybody, <laughs> so, so we'll see. <laughs>